Welcome to the launch of our report, The Social Responsibilities of Scientists and Engineers, A View From Within. This is a report of a three-year study supported by funds from the US National Science Foundation. My name is Jessica Windham. I am director of the AAAF Scientific Responsibility, Human Rights and Law Program. And it's my honor to be presenting this work uh, to you today. This work is the effort of multiple individuals. Myself, Melissa Anderson, Susan Hinkins, Joel Erickson, Annette Olson, Melanie Jeske, Rebecca Liu, Jennifer Weeding, and Rose Jaffe. I am pleased to be joined today by two discussants. Laurie Diane Hill, a sociologist and associate executive director of the American Educational Research Association, and Robert Pennick, a philosopher who's leading a scientific virtue project, the results of which I am very excited to be learning about, hopefully shortly. Uh, Robert Pennick also serves as president <clears throat> of Sigma Psi, the Honor Society. So, to begin. What are the views of scientists and engineers as to their social responsibilities? That was the guiding question of our three-year study. We recognize that the internal responsibilities of scientists and engineers are enshrined in codes of ethics, the US common rule, and more. They're reflected in the practice of internal review boards and the subject of specific training and funding requirements. But as Mark Frankel and Rebecca Carlson noted 10 years ago, these responsibilities are related to, but different to the external responsibilities of scientists and engineers to society. Our goal was to dive more deeply into these external responsibilities. The genesis for our investigation was twofold. Most immediately, the United Nations is going through a process of exploring what the human right to science means, a right recognized in the International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights that speaks specifically of the freedom indispensable for scientific research, but does not reflect the flip side of those freedoms, the responsibilities of scientists. We wanted to help the UN think comprehensively about what this right meant by contributing the understanding from the scientific and engineering communities. At the same time, it's impossible to ignore the many existential threats to society that have understandings, answers, and in some instances, contributing factors in science and technology, and that have fueled growing discussion about the roles and responsibilities of scientists and engineers uh, with and within and, and to society. Climate change being an obvious one, rapid technological developments with immense potential for good and for harm being another. This has combined in recent years with more direct engagement of scientists and the scientific and engineering communities in social movements, from the March for Science, the Me Too movement that has had its own science flavor, and the broader social justice movements sparked by Black Lives Matter. We now live in a time of the COVID-19 pandemic that has laid bare the persistent systemic social inequities the risks that public distrust of science and scientists pose, and the need for scientists and engineers to be self-reflective, to understand their role in society and to engage thoughtfully. It's our hope that our work and, and that of others grappling with what it means for scientists and engineers to have social responsibilities will move us forward as a society to address these challenges. So it was that we pursued this two-part study, the first component of which involved a global survey and the second piece of which, taking advantage of funds that pandemic, the pandemic prohibited us um, from spending for travel and in-person meetings, involved a qualitative piece focused on the US. Our global survey addressed three, uh, sorry, four specific questions. What are the views of scientists and engineers on their social responsibilities? What are the different sources of their beliefs? What are the factors that influence their ability to fulfill their social responsibilities? And what if any differences exist according to multiple demographic variables? Section one of the survey instrument uh, addressed demographic questions. Section two, behaviors, their importance and action. Sources or factors influencing views, factors influencing fulfillment, 
and then there was an open-ended section. In April of 2019, we had 20 partners who together represented a membership of over 300,000. Those partners provided to us uh, information about their membership with demographic details and a member identifying number, no contact details and no personally identifying information. We determined a sample of over 20,000. But by June, two organisations had left the project. We had 640 responses. So we increased the size of the sample significantly to 100, over 134,338. Our partners with whom we worked uh, from this point forward were the following. Primarily those organizations located in the United States with some external. Representing disciplines across the sciences, life, social, behavioral, physical, as well as engineering. In total, our usable responses were 4,892, 4,789 of which were in scope, with a response rate, therefore, of less than 4%. So we could not uh, draw inferences back to the sample frame, and so the analysis that follows is descriptive of the characteristics of those who responded. Our methodology was that of a basic sampling theory, but because of the small response rates, that ruled out statistical analysis. We conducted factor analysis and thematic analysis of the open-ended responses. So who did respond? The distribution of respondents by gender was consistent with what was known of the sample frame. 68% of respondents identified as male. The distribution of respondents was highly skewed towards older individuals with almost 50% of respondents being over 60. The age distribution is reflected in the number of years of professional experience reported by respondents. 50% had more than 26 years of experience while just under 20% had zero to five years of experience. The distribution of respondents by field of study was consistent with what is known of the sample frame, here based in large measure on the partner organisations involved in the study. The majority of respondents came from the university or college sector, but still we had 13% from industry, 11% from government. The distribution of respondents by region uh, with what is known of this was consistent with what is known uh, of the sample frame and again reflects in large measure the membership of the organizations with which we partnered. Across all three measures, most respondents, that is 67%, were located in North America. The survey asked about the highest science or engineering degree that respondents had completed. Three quarters had completed a doctoral degree and another 15% a master's degree. The primary role of 56% of those who responded to the survey was either researcher or educator. So what did we find? Overall, in response to the first substantive question, the response average for importance ranged from between important and very important. For action, the response average was generally lower than often and showed more variability. There were, however, some patterns that may be suggestive of areas worthy of further explore, exploration. And so I'm going to go through these findings now. This figure shows the percentages of very important and important responses to the social responsibility items listed in the survey. The items are arranged in order by percentage of people who responded very important. And you can see that over 50% of respondents answered either very important or important to all social responsibilities. That said, there were still multiple respondents who did not consider these behaviors to be applicable to them. 22% said not applicable to paying particular attention to how your work or research may affect vulnerable populations. 15% said communicate to the public risks associated with the conduct of your work or research was not applicable. And 11% say, said taking steps to prevent or minimize the risks to, to, to society associated with the conduct of their work was not applicable. The respondents in the discipline of mathematics and statistics were the most likely to find these behaviors not applicable. 
Maintaining the order from the earlier figure, here you see the responses with regard to action and whether respondents always or often behave according to the given social responsibility. Here you see much greater variability in responses and for five of the responsibilities, less than 50% of respondents uh, indicated that they always or often behave according to that social responsibility. Those five being, and, and, and these are abbreviated um, versions of the, of the responsibilities laid out in the instrument, notify authorities of suspected or observed research or professional misconduct, mentor people from historically marginalized groups, participate in government policy deliberations in your area of expertise, broadly communicate negative results, and receive training or education on social responsibilities of scientists and engineers. And in this case, for two of the responsibilities, more than 35% of respondents found these actions not applicable. You can see those in the slide. For data reduction purposes, we perform factor analyses on the social responsibilities, both importance and action, and workplace climate items, yielding four factors with the same items in the factors for both importance and action, as well as workplace climate. This provided an additional way to slice and dice our data and explore whether there might be additional suggestive patterns of interest. We computed each respondent's average score for each of the factors, public, risk, research, and communicate. This revealed that the research category had the highest mean in importance, but the risk category had the highest mean in action. For each factor, the importance mean was higher than the action mean. The action means have higher standard deviations than the importance means. There was a pattern of higher means for both importance and action for respondents from the life sciences, except with respect to the responsibilities associated with risk, for which the mean recorded for social and behavioral sciences was higher with regard to both importance and action. There was a pattern of higher means for importance among respondents from the nonprofit sector, but no such pattern held true, however, for action. There was a pattern of higher means for both importance and action for technicians and lower means for engineers. There was an overall pattern of higher means for importance among younger respondents with the exception of the responsibilities with regard to research. There was a pattern of higher means for both importance and action for female respondents as compared to male respondents. Uh, and here it's probably worth remembering that women respondents were more likely to be young and young respondents were more likely to be female. The open-ended responses suggested additional categories and added greater texture to the existing behaviors given in the survey instrument. Personal and professional characteristics were suggested by multiple respondents, including humility, truth, honesty, as social responsibilities as scientists. Education and training was another area of focus in the open-ended responses, including behaviors of mentoring and serving as a role model. Diversity, including advocating for equity in the workplace was raised, and there were many comments addressing elements of ethics. We turn then to the next question. How influential have each of the following been on your views of the behaviors that you've just considered? Re respondents were asked about the influence of people, institutions, activities, and other experiences on their views, list, uh, on the behaviors listed in the survey. The only item that was indicated as very influential by over half of respondents was mentors. In the childhood category, 45% of respondents described family as very influential. Codes of ethics were noted as very influential by only 24%. And the five items related to policies of very ki various kinds were all under 19%. As with the social responsibility scores, each respondent's average influence score was computed for each of the influence categories. Professional education has the highest mean among the influence scores, and the category of external factors has the lowest mean. Then with regard to climate, there was one consistent pattern. Higher social responsibility means for those with high climate scores, be that 
positive and supportive or negative and pressured climates. This was an unexpected result. And so a question has to be asked, are, particularly, are these individuals particularly attuned to workplace environment, be they in a positive and supportive environment or a negative and pressured climate that may make them more aware of the importance and enactment of social responsibilities? In summary then, overall, there were very high levels of reported importance across all behaviours for those who responded to the survey. Responsibilities concerned with research were considered by res respondents more important across the four identified factors. Views on importance, however, were not matched by high levels of reported action among respondents. Mentors, colleagues and peers had particular influence on the views of the respondents. Codes of ethics and similar based documents did not. Among the responses, there were differences by discipline, employment sector, gender and age that were identified. These cannot be generalizable. Uh, and so our views are not definitive, but these may be suggestive of additional areas for exploration. So we took the findings of this survey then and turned to the second component of the study. And here we asked, what are the important social responsibilities of scientists? Which of the social responsibilities mentioned are the most important? How well do scientists' actual behaviors align with the social responsibilities that have been mentioned? And what are the best ways to support scientists in fulfilling the responsibilities that they've identified? We engaged 17 people in interviews in a focus group, vice presidents of research, uh, research integrity officers, leaders in their field, scientists and engineers, uh, research, uh, a responsible conduct of research instructors, and individuals from federal funding agencies. In response to the question, what are the important social responsibilities of scientists, answers coalesced around the conduct of science, including those traditionally associated with research integrity, Responsibilities arising from the management of research, including the diversity of research teams and the management of research funds, and responsibilities that are externally facing, including the consideration of the social impact of science, the engagement of the community in science, and communication of science. So I'll take each of those separately. In terms of the conduct of science, research integrity was seen as not being just an internal responsibility, but rather one that should be considered also a social responsibility. As one responsible conduct of research instructor said, I might tend to think of all the core responsibilities, we might call them of research integrity, as being about social responsibility, about ensuring the social value of the outputs in that person's domain of expertise. With regard to management of research, that included fostering both technical and social diversity within teams. Working with other scientists and with unexpected partners is another way of thinking about that, that being multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary teams, but also working with the communities, the subject of research. The welfare and well-being of students and postdocs was addressed, and there was a focus on the stewardship of funds in a way fiscally responsible and accountable. In the area of societal impact and engagement, there was a focus on communication of science among peers, with publics who are communicated to, and communication uh, with communities. As one individual said in the focus group, we usually think it's one way. I'm going to tell the public what I'm doing rather than listening to what people say that they want or what they're worried about, the kind of research questions that need to be answered. This was tied in some respects to conversations about unintended consequences. Researchers have a responsibility, one focus group participant said, to think about the impact of the relevance of their research question and how it's formed and how it's framed to the public. Such comments were made indicating that to do so would help address and well, identify and address unintended consequences. Similarly, to work in partnership with a community means to be, be aware of community norms or community expectations. In response to the question, which of the social responsibilities mentioned are the most important, 
Interview, interviewees hesitated to identify one, but when encouraged to do so, several identified responsibilities associated with conduct and management of research. For example, addressing the structures of science and the opportunities to become a scientist and to excel, and also to engage the community. Within the focus group, who was made up of responsible conduct of research instructors, the focus was on doing good science. As one said, and this is actually coming from interviews, you can't have the external responsibilities unless the science is solid, because that's a foundation. Similarly, coming from a federal funding agency, I think it's probably in working to ensure that the public facing outputs being publications of research are sound. I think that is the social function of research. In response to the question, how well do scientists actually be actual behaviors align with the social responsibilities mentioned, both interviewees and, and the focus group participants struggled to identify areas of clear alignment. And they gave several reasons for that. A lack of awareness within the scientific and engineering communities about their social responsibilities, the varying expectations across institutions, disagreement about what it actually means to implement responsibilities in practice, the need to constantly refresh understandings of social responsibilities, pressures to show results, publish or perish, and the failure within the scientific and engineering communities to be self-reflective. In response to the question, what are the best ways to support scientists in fulfilling their responsibilities? One commonly mentioned was training and mentors. Others that were addressed included the role of professional societies and codes of ethics, policy, diversity, equity, and inclusion. With regard to training and mentors, the focus was on young and early career scientists. Young here being uh, tertiary uh, STEM students rather than students in K through 12. As one vice president of research said, as we socialize people into being scientists, we should also teach them how to take that out of the lab and into the world, when and when not to do so. And various approaches were discussed. The stick, formal structured programs, integrating it into responsible conduct of research training. Or the carrot, uh, making such training a requirement by funders, requiring such training for, uh, for promotion and tenure. Approaches that were discussed included experiential learning, situational format, and case-based learning. This was seen as, as important to sensitize students and early career scientists to these issues, but also there was, there was a recognized need to give them resources to know what questions to ask and of whom. And here, institutional support was seen as vital for such training to actually have impact. With regard to professional societies, they were seen as having a potential role in hosting trainings. They were recognized for defining the culture of a discipline and defining standards of contact, conduct, not necessarily in a strictly normative sense, um, but through practice. At the same time, and as reflective of the, of the results from the survey, there was little support for codifying social responsibilities. What was seen as more valuable was the process of establishing a code uh, and, and the discussion that that would engender in the engagement rather than the code itself. There was limited role for policy seen amongst those who were involved in the qualitative study. Um, the, there was a potential value in targeted policy interventions, for example, with regard to strategic hiring. There was also some discussion around the value of recruiting uh, to create a more diverse scientific uh, pipeline. But through this qualitative piece, there were four threads or themes that emerged, including challenges. The risk of uh, detracting from one of the core values of science. As one person said, there's a lot of room in the scientific community for seeking knowledge for the sake of seeking knowledge. There was a need to take into account that scientists are not particularly knowledgeable about how to take what you're learning into the world in a large socially responsible or in a irresponsible way. There was a recognized need to consider the view that what it is to be a scientist and what it is to be trusted as a scientist is to be neutral and how might that be jeopardized uh, through more social engagement. Trust was a common theme and recognized as necessary for maintaining public funding, restoring or maintaining the prestige of scientists in society and necessary to have science and scientists 
believed. This was tied to good science and the need to build trust to make the science actually taken up by people because they trust it, to make them listen to you in the future and make them give you more funding. There was also a recognized generational shift. Changes have been happening in the role of science and society and scientists in society, in the responsibilities of scientists to society, in the need to address these issues within the STEM community. And this shift was recognized uh, across participants. As one responsible conduct of research instructor said, students are in, interested in these sorts of things. Uh, and it's more of a conversation now on campus, said one vice president of research. There's also disciplinary specificity. There's increasing multidisciplinary nature of the work, uh, of, well, of the questions that are being asked and, and the research teams that are forming to address those. And this was recognized as having both benefits and pitfalls. Responses were sometimes couched as being from a specific dis disciplinary perspective. And it was said that disciplinary ways of knowing are discrete and specific. Similarly, when talking about professional societies, as I mentioned before, they were seen as creating and reinforcing specific cultures for a discipline. So what next? In our report, we address three areas. I don't in any way suggest that these are intended to be comprehensive, rather we're aiming to start a conversation. With regard to scientific and engineering institutions and organizations, they can identify mentors, colleagues, peers to engage in dialogue and training. Engage the institutional community in a process to articulate its values of social responsibility to which they want to commit. Structures of support and processes of evaluation. For educators and trainers, there was a recognized clear role. For designing and delivering age appropriate instructional material, engaging students in discussion about these topics. And specifically with regard to responsible conduct of research instructors, how could they explore the current content that they address, whether it includes elements of social responsibilities and how they could be supplemented? Identifying effective pedagogical approaches and leveraging the multidisciplinary nature of a lot of RCR training. And finally, for scientific and engineering societies, those that do have codes of ethics could explore how to design an ethics code review process that fosters discussion and de debate, defining the culture and serving as a living document. They could also develop tools and guidelines to support behavior consistent with social responsibilities. There were of course limitations to our study. With regard to the survey, as I mentioned previously, we partnered with organizations, uh, membership organizations, the form of partnership meant that we were unable to directly monitor who within the survey sample had responded and who had not. That limited our ability to conduct follow-up and that may have contributed to the low response rate. We distributed the survey in the six languages of the United Nations only. A greater number of translations might have opened up the survey to more respondents. And because we partnered with scientific and engineering associations primarily in the US, that may also have limited our reach internationally. And the qualitative study was limited by design and offers lots of opportunities for expansion. So what next? We'll be providing the data specific to each partner organization to them to conduct further inquiry into that data should they choose. And 12 months from today, the launch of this report, we'll be transferring the, da the data to a public use data file. Sorry, to a, 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 a long-term public accessible repository. So in closing, I want to thank those who are part of the advisory committee a multidisciplinary international group of subject matter expert, experts um, and technical experts who advised us along the path of this study. To my co-authors and to others who contributed conceptually at the initial stages of this study, I thank you all. So with that, it is now my great pleasure to introduce to you our first discussant, Laurie Diane Hill, who, as I mentioned, she is a sociologist. She is the Associate Executive Director of the American Educational Research Association. 
and Laurie will be sharing her reflections uh, on our report and where she sees it sitting contextually from her perspective. Laurie? Hi, Laurie. Good afternoon. Thank you, Jessica. And good afternoon, everyone. It really is my pleasure to have an opportunity to participate in what is really an exciting launch event and conversation focusing on the social responsibility of scientists and engineers report. My thanks to AAAS and to Jessica, of course, for extending the invitation. And I also want to congratulate you, Jessica, and your colleagues on completing this analysis that addresses what are really um, an important set of questions framed in the research that you've just presented. So in reading the report and reviewing the findings, uh, initially led me to reflect on when and how, at least in the areas of education research and in sociology, which are the two fields to which I am most closely connected, the issue of social responsibilities among the scientists has been taken up. And in reflecting on that, I discovered that it has been taken up in many ways over quite a long period of time. Most recently with an annual meeting theme that uh, was entitled Accepting Educational Responsibility, uh, past president of the American Educational Research Association, Sean Harper reminded education researchers that in addition to being social scientists, they are also citizens of the context where their research is produced. Where it's produced, disseminated, and in cases of uh, practice-based research, implemented. So this is but one example of the reality that even in, science, social, even in scientific fields or in social science fields, uh, where the link between the substance of science itself and the concerns of society at large uh, is certainly viewed to be more direct, and where it's assumed that there's a stronger sense of social responsibility among scientists, there's still a considerable amount of work to be done. Uh, in most social science fields, there is an implicit assumption uh, that uh, scientists in those fields have a greater understanding and clarity about how to operationalize their social responsibilities to the society at large. Although the findings from the report suggest some discipline-specific differences in views on social responsibility. Um, there is plenty of evidence that the challenge that scientists and engineers face in translating what are the positive views of social responsibilities and their importance into relevant action is a serious issue across fields and disciplines. So given the findings of the report, which highlight this misalignment, which among other things highlight the misalignment among scientists and engineers between their perspectives on social responsibilities and their related behaviors and actions, I want to comment briefly on a related I think broader issue that follows from some of the findings in the report and, and also make a case for um, as a part of this work and thinking about how it might move forward for interrogating the intersection of scientists understandings of their citizenship in the professional communities and their citizenship in broader society and looking at that as a foundational step in identifying ways to integrate the consideration of social responsibilities into the education and training of scientists and engineers, which is an important point laid out in the report. The findings presented in the study raise what I think is raises many important questions, but one of which um, struck me in particular, and that is how do we invest 
in helping scientists understand not only how to do good science, but also to take action that reflects what I would characterize as scientists doing good and to understand that as a key component of their social responsibilities. So using the broader lens of citizenship across contexts where one's identity as a scientist uh, or an engineer can be can have relevance that's not tied to one's particular discipline. Um, doing this, I believe, has substantial potential for framing agendas for expanding research, for expanding infrastructure, and other resources that can help prepare scientists and engineers to take action and engage in behaviors that reflect the importance of social, of social responsibility as a function of their citizenship in a specific scientific community as well as in the broader society. So what are the, excuse me, what are the pathways to achieving these kinds of goals? Well, as noted in the report, higher education institutions and professional and professional societies have a critical role to play in training to transform infrastructure and training to provide tools and strategies that foster, once again, greater alignment between scientists' appreciation and understanding of social responsibilities excuse me, uh, to, the capacity, to the, their capacity to enact them. Professional societies have substantial potential to leverage both their convening powers and their centrality to networks of deans and other institutional leaders in higher education. There are really promising models of research societies taking steps to build not to first build a knowledge base in a key area, like the one we're discussing, and also to frame the agenda for such knowledge building in collaboration with higher education leaders who themselves are positioned to take the lead on establishing commitments and creating infrastructure within institutions and across fields that can support the kind of, for example, mentoring that the report indicates is an important influence on, uh, on scientists' experiences and perspectives on social responsibility. The study highlights the potential for professional societies and higher education institutions to provide a really critical and innovative pathway to integrating the resources, integrating and leveraging the resources of these institutions and building on the findings and the critical questions posed from this research study. Interrogating the intersection of scientists' understanding of citizenship in their professional communities and citizenship in the broader society um, is once again foundational to identifying uh, ways to integrate the consideration of social responsibilities into education and training for scientists and engineers and to institutions, professional societies, and higher education institutions, particularly through collaborative work with their leadership, are essential to building that pathway. And we'll end there and turn things over to Jessica. Thank you so much, Laurie. I have so many points um, that I want to follow up on. That was a wonderful way of broadening the context um, of what we're talking about in the report, and I, I thank you greatly for that. Uh, it's now my pleasure to reintroduce to you um, Robert Pennick, who 
who, as I said, is leading his own study on scientific values, uh, my understanding of which is we'll be learning uh, the outcomes of that in the coming, I'll say, months. Um, and he also serves as the current president of Sigma Psi, the Honor Society. So thank you very much, uh, Rob. I'll turn over to you before we have a broader discussion. Thanks, Jessica. Uh, I appreciate the opportunity to speak about this very significant study about scientists' views about their social responsibilities. This is a sociological study of descriptive ethics, and as sociologists, we aim to report on what our subjects themselves believe without judgment. This is important work. But I want to comment on the significance of these findings from a philosophical perspective, which focuses not just on what is the case, but what ought to be so. If the scientists in the survey had all said, oh, we have no social responsibilities, that would have been an interesting descriptive finding, but it wouldn't tell us very much or anything about whether scientists should believe that. Okay. So in, in my remarks, I want to view the study not really just as a descriptive result, but to really start to consider how these relate to the prescriptive ethical frameworks uh, that philosophers are interested in. Um, so you could start with just the basic question, why think that scientists have any social responsibilities? And if so, are they just general ones that everyone has or are they particular or special ones that they have as scientists? Uh, from a prescriptive point of view, it can't simply be assumed that scientists have social responsibilities. You can think of this in relationship to other professions. I mean, what social responsibilities do chefs have, right? Consider Julia Child, Alice Walters, Wolfgang Puck, right? They serve the public, but we don't typically think of this in ethical terms. Um, chef Jose Andres, who formed the World uh, Central Kitchen to feed victims of natural disasters, is rightly admired for his humanitarian efforts but this work is considered supererogatory. It goes above and beyond what duty requires. Uh, chefs have to follow the law, of course, and be sure that their establishments meet the health codes. Uh, but besides that sort of things, most people wouldn't think that chefs as chefs have special social responsibilities, right? Similar things could be said for most other professions. We don't typically ask, what are the social responsibilities of actors or athletes or gardeners, right? So one might ask, you know, why should we think scientists are any different in this ethical respect? So that's the prescriptive question, right? What might be a justified ethical basis for saying first that one does have social responsibility as a scientist, and then second, for determining what those scientific responsibilities are? Okay. So there are three general ethical uh, frameworks, and I'm just going to go through them in turn, starting with deontological ethics. Deontology says that you conceive of morality in relationship to the fulfillment of duty. So that's one model one might take with regard to um, uh, scientists uh, in terms of social relationships. Uh, you can think of this in terms of, of licensing, right? Society grants uh, certain individuals special rights, right? For example, the right to practice medicine, right, in return for special responsibilities that they then must take on, the expectation of expertise or special professor, professional responsibilities that are prescribed by law, right? Architects, engineers, lawyers, physicians, all, all fall into that kind of a category, okay? They do owe society something because they're receiving something from society that's reciprocal in that way. Um, but science is not a licensed profession, right? So that kind of ethical basis for social responsibility doesn't really apply here. Now you might think, okay, well, there's another kind of responsibility here that's a contractual one that also falls under deontology. Um, there's an obligation you might say for scientists to society because society pays for their research in large part, right? Much scientific research is funded by taxpayers through the NSF, NIH, DOD, right? And that provides a clear ethical obligation to return a benefit to society, right? NSF explicitly incorporates this perspective in its broader impact requirement, okay? And we see this in the arguments that uh, are made that publicly funded research should be published in open access journals, for example. This is to say that because funding comes from society, there's a reciprocal responsibility. And in the survey, you see some um, uh, results that indicate this, right? Where findings say that 
scientists recognize a responsibility to manage public research funding funds responsibly or to communicate your work in a way that makes it understandable to the public. That's recognizing this type of reciprocal relationship. But you know, notice that doesn't apply to industry scientists, right? So if the moral obligation to have responsibility were only by virtue of the funding source, then you'd say, well, the industry scientist's duty is really just to the employees, employers, okay? So maybe that's too limited a notion. So maybe there's a more general uh, kind of obligation from duty uh, from the social contract. Uh, and ethical theory might have something to say here that perhaps there's just a general obligation that scientists have to fulfill the duty of non-maleficence, non to do no harm, right? Uh, or a principle of beneficence, to actually do good. A principle of justice, right? To make sure that they're fair in their dealings and consider uh, issues of, of distributive and, uh, and other sorts of justice. Now, these aren't particular to science. They're general moral obligations that science ought to follow just as anyone else should. Uh, and in the survey, it does seem that there's some recognition in line with this kind of an obligation, right? Where uh, recognition is that scientists should take steps to prevent or minimize the risks to society associated with conduct or your work, work and research, right? That's a non-maleficence principle there, to work there. To advocate for publicly funded science and engineering that improves the quality of life for some or all members of society. Again, a, a recognition of an obligation of beneficence and justice and so on. So it seems to me as though there is, from the deontological point of view, some obligation for these kinds of, of duties. The second major framework uh, is called utilitarian ethics. Uh, utilitarianism conceives of morality in terms of the consequences of actions. So I should or shouldn't do some action depending upon whether it adds or subtracts to the total happiness of uh, humanity, for example. Uh, and this puts uh, a framework it's in terms of um, risk benefit analysis, right? So you might say that so scientists have a social responsibility in the sense that they should consider the possible goods and harms of their research. Uh, and indeed, right, one did see some results of this kind in the survey findings as well, uh, saying that when deciding upon what work or research to pursue, one should take into account whether its potential effects would benefit or harm society, right? So that's uh, in line with this utilitarian justification of ethics. Now, uh, my own work has been in the third uh, uh, area, which is called virtue ethics. Uh, virtue ethics conceives of morality in terms of moral character and the, the development of judgment. And it identifies and analyzes virtues in relationship to the telos or the goal of human life. Uh, and my particular work has been to focus on a narrower notion of that, what I call vocational virtue theory, um, where you ask what's the telos or goal of particular vocational practices such as for science, right? The basic goal there is to discover uh, empirical truths about the world. From that sort of analysis, you can then get uh, a picture of what the internal um, constitutive values and virtues of the scientist ought to be, right? Um, one of those traits would be something like uh, objectivity, right? Uh, and we see this reflected in the survey, right? With findings saying that scientists should mitigate personal biases uh, in your research when offering expert advice, right? As to say, it's not what you want to have, but objectively, what, what you uh, find to be the case. Um, another finding uh, that when communicating research findings, you should acknowledge other relevant research interpretations, whether or not consistent with your own view, right? So this fits with a virtue theoretic emphasis upon the importance of objectivity uh, as a scientific value. In our survey, um, curiosity and honesty come up as central. Uh, and honesty here uh, shows up very clearly in some of these results as well, where it says, when it comes to your attention, address the improper use of your research findings or products by others, right? Notify appropriate authorities of suspected or observed research professional misconduct, right? This is a recognition, it seems, that we see in this survey results of the importance of this value, this virtue of honesty. Um, uh, uh, similarly, the, the importance of, of passing on uh, the culture of, of virtue and so on through mentoring and so on. And here too, that's seen in the finding where it says, 
um, that they recognized the importance of fostering the interests of young generations in science and engineers and so on. Um, and then um, the second part of a vocational virtue approach is that that's situated within the larger notion, not just of scientific research flourishing, but human flourishing. And there we see it again as well with a survey saying that scientists should take steps to prevent or minimize the risk to society associated with the conduct of your work or research. So it seemed to me it, it's actually uh, interesting that one can find from the point of view all three general uh, ethical um, frameworks uh, that this is something that that fits in with the survey results. Ethics is not and should not be foreign to science. Um, vocational virtue theory holds that science has a moral structure and it provides a theoretical framework for setting out ideals that we should strive for, not only ones that are internal to science, but how this relates to human flourishing generally. And I'd say that this survey is consistent uh, with the hypothesis that scientists recognize responsibilities that are in line not just within, uh, but uh, in general uh, to ethical theory broadly. The mission of Sigma Xi, Scientific Honor Society, is to enhance the health of the research enterprise, foster integrity in science and engineering, and promote the public's understanding of science for the purpose of improving the human condition. And the mission of AAAS is to advance science, engineering, and innovation throughout the world for the benefit of all people. Right? So I think these values are actually reflected uh, in those mission statements. Uh, and it's heartening to find from the study that the surveyed scientists recognized, at least in a broad sense, that they do have such responsibilities. And I would say the next interesting step out of this is to start to examine these issues more directly and in more specific detail in terms of the prescriptive uh, ethical theory. And this is a great step forward with that. Thanks. Robert, thank you so much uh, for those comments and, and helping us think of different frameworks um, through which to look at the results of the study. Laurie, I'm going to invite you back as well, uh, and I wanted us to have a discussion. We've got about seven minutes left in the event, so um, we'll, we'll have to give pithy responses. But something that came through from both of you in different ways was the challenges of, of translating views into action. And I'll ask Laurie you this question first, but Robert, I'd be interested in your views too, as to whether there are examples from the past, so not necessarily within the context of the social responsibilities of scientists, but some other example that might be instructive of how um, a, a framework, how growing understandings in a certain area and views were successfully integrated um, into individual and institutional practice. Laurie, you first. So I will briefly highlight something that is, is more in the present than in the past in the sense that it's a, it's a conversation that's underway. But certainly the, the genesis of engagement, and this is one of the examples I had in mind when I talked about the work of research societies in higher education of, of professional societies engaging with deans in a particular field to um, frame an agenda, begin a conversation that is meant to lead to broader understandings of where, um, where sort of service activities fit into um, or get scaled up in considerations of tenure and evaluations for tenure. And sort of that's an example of a question and an issue that is broadly appreciated, but sort of the steps to leverage networks, begin a collaborative collaborative conversation, and now being in the process of laying out steps to um, for committed deans to integrate um, the insights into their actual infrastructures is is um, that's like one of my favorite examples actually. That's great, thank you. And actually, the, if we had time, I was going to ask a question about how the, this this area of social responsibilities may butt up against institutional structures. And you hit on the head exactly what I had in mind in terms of promotion and tenure. So thank you, Robert. What are your thoughts? You're on mute. 
Thanks. Uh, I'll just reiterate uh, the, the two quotes I mentioned from the mission statements of AAAS and Sigma Xi, right, which I think are two organizations that because they represent science broadly rather than particular disciplines, see themselves as representing values and promoting these values. Uh, and that's something I think we don't talk about enough. Uh, and, and the survey here gives us sort of a, a, a way to, to, to start those conversations with some data in hand um, to do what I think those both organizations have traditionally seen themselves as doing, which is trying to represent and um, uh, build uh, the culture of science uh, in this positive, uh, ethically informed way. Uh, there's obviously much more that we can do with that. Uh, it's only just begun, um, uh, but I think that's uh, that's heartening uh, that, that that can happen in this kind of way. And so you foreshadowed the other question I wanted to ask both of you. Obviously, this was a study that engaged 18 professional societies in sciences and, and engineering. Uh, we are each in, in different ways, Robert as president, Laurie and myself as staff, within professional societies. What opportunities do you see, and Robert, your comment just went to this in, in part, but what opportunities do you see for professional societies, be they multidisciplinary in the nature of but all three of our societies, um, or disciplinary specific in taking what we've learned from this study um, either to build on its knowledge or, or to, to make particular interventions. Um, Robert, I'll start with you. I, I think this is just uh, important with regard to conversation starters. Uh, scientists in, in talking about these things don't typically have a vocabulary, which is part of the reason I wanted to introduce ethical theory. But the other thing that's important for scientists, of course, is, is having data. Uh, and that means that this is something that provides the seed for conversations, right? Knowing that other scientists are, are thinking about this when you ask them provides a, a, a basis upon which further conversations can happen. And I think we need to find a way to do that systematically. So this is great as a step in that direction. Thank you, Laurie. So I would echo Robert's point about the importance of the study and this research as um, helping us not have to start from scratch, which is no small thing. But I, it also, it struck me um, as I was uh, listening to part of Robert's comments that um, the, the instructions, guidance, or urgence to um, consider code, codes of ethics as a part of the work of how professional societies, I think, is um, it is valuable far beyond the particular focus of this work. And I also think, again, connecting to something that that Robert noted, that sort of looking at the codes of ethics in the context of the mission statements, which overwhelmingly have this. Um, and for the good of society dimensions to them, irrespective of what the particular field is, um, connecting the dots between uh, policies and ethics and mission and vision, I think, um, is another valuable takeaway from the direction you've offered in the report. Thank you. Thank you both so much. We're, we're one minute before time. So I want to thank you, Laurie, and you, Robert, thank so much for your, your contributions to the discussion and broadening um, from the findings of, of our study. I want to thank our participants in the event and point out that for them, uh, the, the copy of the report is available in the handouts digitally online. For those who watch this later, um, the report is available on our website, aaas.org forward slash srhrl. Uh, I commend the report to you uh, and I hope that this is just the beginning or the continuation of a conversation um, that will lead to action change in the future. So thank you all very much. Thank you.